On behalf of the Open Center Online, I want to welcome you all. The Open Center is the longest running urban holistic center in the country since 1984, and we are a nonprofit organization. So as always, we appreciate your support. Thank you for joining us for this free intro, Green Medicine, a four month training in herbalism with Pika Trenkel. Pika holds a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. With 40 years of experience as an intuitive healer, herbalist, and homeopathic consultant, her deep interest lies in the integration of spiritual and physical healing and how our relationship with the natural world affects our well being. We are very lucky to have her here with us today, and I will now hand it over to Pika. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Wow, this is a, a nice turnout. Um, as always, I'm very grateful to be here and to have you all meet me here in this Zoom space. Um, less than optimal, in my view, but we, we, we live with this strange new set of standards and um, we make the best of it. So I wanted to say a little bit more about my background because I do think that it's very important. Um, I, I think that it's very important who the person is that you're learning from, not only what that person knows. Um, and so I started my practice in 1981. I had a practice doing shiatsu and polarity and flower essences. And I went on to study craniosacral work and other kinds of pranic healing. Um, I all along studied herbs. I think I studied herbs from, you know, when I was a kid, just out of interest, right? And I think, you know, most of us have a sense that the herbs actually hold some importance for us, whether we use them as medicine or we paint them in pictures or we identify them in the wild or we, you know, we just like having plants around. Um, there's something very innate about, um, about knowing the plants. So for years I, I did that body work and then I had a family and I had too much touching with three little kids. So I switched my practice to a consulting practice and um, became an herbal consultant. And I did that for a number of years, um, very successfully, but at a certain point realized I needed to learn uh, homeopathy. So I went back to school and I've had 10 years of formal training in classical homeopathy. And so the cornerstone of my practice now is as a homeopath, but always I use herbs in my practice as well. So um, it's not like I left one thing and, and, and went on to another, uh, but it was a natural progression of my work. And then some years went by doing homeopathy, again, successfully teaching green medicine. I've been teaching this class for 25 years, twice a year, um, at the New York Open Center, um, it, it worried me to see how herbs had become commodified, so commodified, so taken up by, uh, you know, businesses, you know, uh, stores, not so much the herb stores, the herb stores are pretty great, but um, in this way where if you go into a health food store now, most, almost every health food store cannot offer you herbs in their whole form, except in tea bags, right? You don't see, you don't see bulk herbs very many places. And more than that, uh, herbs are touted for certain diseases, right? You know, take, you know, um, uh, nothing's coming to mind at the moment, but, uh, you know, take kava to relax or, you know, take, take this thing for your arthritis. Um, 
And, and so herbs had, have become sort of an adjunct to a medical model of thinking. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But then I decided that the only way to really address this after having taught herbs for so many years um, and feeling like, oh, you know, once people really understand how natural this is, they'll gravitate towards natural and then seeing, you know, just that not really happening. Um, at least not, you know, from my perspective. So I decided to go back to school to get a Master of Divinity. I went to Union Theological Seminary. Uh, I didn't apply anywhere else because Union has so much to do with doing work in the world. Um, and so I received my Master of Divinity with the intention of being able to then speak and write about healing as a theological issue. And I think right now we're in a place where we have to have more of these kinds of discussions, especially in this pandemic. You know, what are we trying to accomplish? Why did the pandemic happen? You know, what is our way forward into a future where our mode of healing is not itself a major polluter of the, of the environment? which our medical system is. So that's a lot, right? That's, that's sort of where I'm coming from. I have had children as well as having a practice. So everything that I teach about, I really have had practical experience with. And that's also really important because you can read a lot about herbs and have some ideas about herbs, but if you don't know how they actually work in the body and actually with real people, um, it's, it's limited. Um, so I feel very grateful that I've been in practice all these years so I can see what actually works and what doesn't work. Um, and so I teach things uh, in a way that is very accessible, very, very easy for people to um, apply. Okay. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, I will talk about the course itself and the, and the design of the course and what we'll cover, but I want to talk a little bit about the different paradigms that we're, that we're looking at here. Um, when we think of disease in our time, we generally think of disease and the next thing that comes is fear. Now that's very natural, right? But before the advent of industrialized medicine, generally speaking, if someone was fearful of disease and they went to a practitioner, it was partly the practitioner's role to reassure, to say, I think, you know, this, this could be fine, this could be natural, these are the things that we can do. Um, and now we have this sense of disease. Once you have a disease, and heaven forbid, it's something very serious like cancer, there's a, a way of understanding it in our time that once you have it, it's only going to go in a single direction. It's only going to go from, from where you are now to worse without some massive intervention. And, and then there's the paradigm of health where, where there's more an understanding of faith in the process of healing and, and holding the idea that what if things know how to heal, right? What if, what if healing is a, is a process that happens on its own, which I've seen countless times in my practice. This idea of an organizing principle in nature, right? The herbs, the herbs actually are uh, the, the original food for us. I, 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 um, I do preach. I'm an itinerant preacher uh, and I preached on Sunday. And in my sermon, I had this quote because I was teaching on creation. Um, and this is from Wendell Berry. Some of you might know that name. And he's writing about his childhood in the 1930s in Kentucky, I believe. Um, and during the Great Depression. And he writes, as I remember them from that time, farm people on the way somewhere characteristically had buckets or kettles or baskets in their hands, sometimes sacks on their shoulders. Those were hard times. 
And so a lot of the fetching and carrying had to do with foraging, searching the fields and woods for nature's free provisions, greens in the springtime, fruits and berries in the summer, nuts in the fall. There was fishing in warm weather and hunting in cold weather. People did these things for food and for pleasure, not for sport. Um, and it, that quote really struck me because I don't think that the majority of us would even know what we were looking at. Um, I'm just looking at the chat here. Okay. Oh, okay. Hi, Yuko. Um, so we wouldn't know what we were looking at. So I'm going to share a story uh, from the very beginning of the pandemic. Well, mid mid it was summertime and I was out for my walk and there's a little pond that I that I walk around uh, pretty much anytime I'm out walking and there's a plant that grows near that pond called bone set the Latin name is Eupatorium perfoliatum I love that plant I can't tell you why it's just every time I see it I'm like oh I love that plant and there's always this one little patch around the pond. And this year, there was that one patch that had like tripled in size. And then there were at least 12 other patches around the pond that had never been there before. And the amazing thing about this is that Eupatorium is an herb whose specific purpose is the treatment of influenza. Right. So there's a way in which we're in a time where we're very, very divorced. Most of us, right? Not talking about everybody. Most of us divorced from the natural world to the degree that we don't know what we're looking at. Um, and very often you'll find that if someone is sick, a plant will come in their vicinity that is a plant that may be helpful for them. And this is not like woo woo. This is something that actually really happens. Um, and this, and another analogy I like to make is that when, so think about, you know, the floods that we've experienced or the wind storms or the, you know, fire storms, right? In, in the West, especially um, where everything's burnt or flooded away or whatever. If we, uh, just watch and wait, what begins to happen is the plants start to come in to heal the place. So the purpose of the plants is not only for us, it's also for the creatures, but it's also for the earth. So you'll see, say, in a vacant lot, which, I mean, in New York City, there's so few of those anymore. But if there were a vacant lot somewhere that was just left unattended by people, you would first see little plants with you know, very shallow roots that kind of grab the soil to keep it from uh, washing away or blowing away. You'd see those things, those come, little clovers, little um, plantain, not, not uh, platanos, it's a different plant. Um, plantains that, that grab the soil. Um, then you'll see after a while, once that, cover has happened, then you'll see plants that have short tap roots. The tap root is just a single root that digs down into the soil, goes down, pulls up minerals from below, brings them up into the leaves. Those leaves die back and that starts to create soil, right? We think that the soil makes plants, but really plants make soil. After the, after the shallow tap roots, then you have the longer tap roots and you have the broader leaves of plants like burdock. Burdock will grow, you see it all the time in uh, areas around construction sites where the soil has been disturbed and it's coming in to, to begin the process of creating healthy soil again. So I bring this up because that happens on the earth and it happens in our bodies. And the reason why there's so much disease in our time is because we've really been, you know, living this industrialized life, lifestyle, 
most of us have to go to great lengths to be able to get food that is, you know, uncontaminated with chemicals, grown in healthy soil, all of these things. Whereas, you know, a hundred years ago, it wasn't anything but that. So, so yes, there is more disease, but there's also been an insidious fear. Um, and, and I would say, you know, with things like where you walk around and you see signs that say detection is protection, right? That may be so, uh, or heart disease, the silent killer. Now, if you have high blood pressure and you're also anxious and you see things like that, it doesn't actually promote a feeling of well being. Um, and so these things I, you know, I really take issue with and I try to teach the other language about healing that way, right? So that, so that we're talking about things moving toward wholeness. Now we are not in a place of wholeness on this planet right now. Um, and this is the other thing that I feel very strongly about uh, that we, you know, and it's, and it's complicated to talk about because we're in the middle of a pandemic still. And the issue of immunity is very much important. I'm not going to say it's not important, but moving on, this idea of immunity to be immune from something um, means that you're exempt. You're not you're not connected at all. You're just you know, and this is what we're seeing with the treatment of the pandemic with the vaccine. We're you know making the attempt to become immune to it. Fine but we also have to look at what gave rise to it in the first place. And many ecologists believe that the pandemic happened as a result of too much pushing into wild areas, too much loss of habitat. And that's when viruses jump species. So we can talk more about examples of that uh, during the course, but I think moving forward, what we, what we uh, you know, in our very complicated time, I'm not saying it's simple, but to begin to think of the idea of adaptability, right? How do we adapt to our environment? And the further question, how do we adapt to our environment in a healthy way when the environment is not healthy? So again, um, I love all the work that's coming out about microbiome health and all of this, but if we don't couple that uh, with the health of the biosphere, uh, we, we as individuals won't stay healthy all that long. So I like to think that way very globally. Also that the human relationship with the natural world, um, you know, people don't usually go to a shopping center for, for replenishment, right? I mean, you go to a shopping center because you like shopping, fine. But for peacefulness, for replenishment, you go to the ocean or you go to the mountains or you go to a park or you sit by the river or whatever it is that is, you know, these eternal things that we as human beings, all of us know um, because we are of the earth. We're from the earth. If you think about the... the um, uh, the history of life on this planet, if you're thinking um, from an evolutionary standpoint, bacteria and microbes and other living creatures were here for 4 billion years before human beings arrived, right? So the idea of outsmarting uh, the, the bacterial world is kind of arrogant to say the least. I don't think we will. Um, but to learn how to live into that. Um, and I was going somewhere with that. Um, it'll come back to me. So this idea of bioregionalism, right? Starting to think about where are your herbs coming from? Where, are, where is your food coming from? Trying as best you can, given your circumstance, to do what you can to source whatever you use, whatever you eat, you know, whatever um, herbs you use, anything from local sources. This is not just, um, this, is, this is something that will be 
absolutely necessary moving forward uh, to lower the pollution in the world and to support ourselves in our own region, which is um, a wonderful thing. So let me just see here, there was something else. So the, the issue with herbs also is that it's not just about knowing them. I think as spring starts and you notice things growing, even if you don't take this course, get yourself uh, a field guide for herbs and also get yourself a book that will tell you what the medicinal uses of the herbs are. <clears throat> See what's growing around you. And if you live in an area that you trust that the soil is not contaminated, which is a little bit tricky these days, but you know can be done even in cities. See if you can eat like a little piece of a dandelion leaf, a little piece of a violet leaf, a little piece of a plantain leaf every day. I think it really helps us to awaken our, uh, what do we wanna call it? to awaken our wildness or awaken our humanness or awaken our connection to the earth. Um, it can be very powerful to do that. The reason I think herbal medicine is a cornerstone moving forward um, and homeopathy, uh, basically because you can, you can make homeopathic remedies. You can take one plant and make homeopathic remedies from that one plant millions of doses. So homeopathy is also super important to how we move forward in an, a sound ecological way. Um, but herbal medicine is easily learned. Anybody who tells you otherwise, um, I, I, don't, I don't get that. Um, herbal medicine is easily learned. And I can tell you that throughout my long um, history of teaching, because I also teach other herbal classes, um, people, don't, people don't get confused because there's nothing new about herbal medicine, right? Herbal medicine is older than we are, right? Um, every culture, every single culture in the world had medicines that were made from plants. Um, it's also potentially inexpensive. And I say that because of the huge number of products on the market um, making, you know, that are just like way, way overpriced, like a bottle of, uh, you know, an extract and one ounce extract of echinacea, you know, I was checking it out in the store, it was like $12. And if you're using echinacea when you're sick, you're gonna go through an ounce in a day. That's not cheap. Um, but if we put it side by side, what our medical system actually costs, leave out, leave out insurance, right? Insurance costs a lot. Medical system is out of control, right? So comparatively, herbs are cheaper. Herbs also put us in touch with where our medicines come from um, and, and how do we use them to stay healthy. Right, so much of the focus in our time is about treating disease. And I certainly don't have anything against treating disease, but I would, love, I would love to see less disease. I would love to see people be able to stay healthy, promote good health before it arrives at a crisis time. Um, and those people who have family histories of you know, usually women who know about herbs. Um, that's also rare. When I have a student who says, you know, my, my aunt, my aunt taught me these things, or my grandmother taught me these things, that's more and more rare as time goes on um, because it, it, it's fallen out of use. Um, in the course, I do talk about why uh, sort of, a nutshell of the history of Western herbalism um, to talk about how it ended up that herbs became kind of a second class citizen, right? Herbs, botanical medicine and homeopathy 
in what was called eclectic medicine, which was like botanical medicine, homeopathy, uh, chiropractic, all the things that we know now are sort of alternatives. Those forms of medical practice were the most popular in this country in the 19th century, not regular medicine. Um, and so we talk about how did that happen? How did what was called regular medicine, which we now call allopathic medicine, um, how did that how did that rise so high, right? And these other ones fall away. So we do talk about that. Um, so someone's asking, what is homeopathy? Yeah, it's a really good question, but I don't wanna take the time to uh, discuss that here because our time is limited and I wanna keep on track. But if you go to my website, which has not been updated, in a while, um, there is a page on homeopathy and my website is pikatrenkel.com. Uh, uh, www so that's it. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the course. Let me get my, my papers straightened out here. First, First, I want to read a quote, and I'm not going to say who it's by uh, right away. When one comes into a city to which he is a stranger, he ought to consider its situation. Sorry about the pronouns. He ought to consider its situation, how it lies as to the winds and the rising of the sun, and as to the waters which the inhabitants use and the mode in which the inhabitants live. And in particular, as the season and the year advances, he can tell you what epidemic diseases will attack the city, either in summer or in winter, and what each individual will be in danger of experiencing. So anybody wanna take a guess? putting you on the spot. Not Thoreau. No, but thinking about Thoreau because Thoreau really understood the terrain of the land in which he lived, Ben Franklin, way more in the past. Hippocrates, 400 BCE. 400 BCE. The Hippocrates also wrote, if the nourishment coming from the mother to the baby in pregnancy, right, when the baby's in the womb, is insufficient, this will result in premature birth. And our, our country, or the medical system, I should say, spends an enormous amount of money on neonatal intensive care units. And very, very few obstetricians teach anything about nutrition. Women need more protein in pregnancy, more calories, simple, right? So these sorts of things trying to, trying to wind our way back into a, not only, you know, what we use, but how we think about it right? How we think about what we use. We also are in a time where whatever our efforts are, whatever the seeds that we plant, those of us who are alive today, we're not going to see the fruits. We are not going to see the fruits, the real fruits. The change that needs to happen now is going to be probably as slow and insidious as, um, as how we got to this point right? Slow and insidious and dedicated. Um, and that the people who come after us will benefit. So it's another very important reason to, you know, re renature, right? Renature your lives as much as possible. Simplify. As Gandhi said, live simply so others may simply live. Um, and we in the West, you know, depending on our situation, 
uh, it's a good thing to at least be contemplating. So in this course, um, we start, as I said, with a brief history of Western herbalism. And, um, you know, and I give you resources for also studying more of that. One of the things when you're studying the history of medicine that you'll find is that, um, especially in the US, when you look in the index of a medical book and you don't see, of a history of medicine book and you don't see botanical medicine and you don't see homeopathy, you know that that's a biased book, right? So those histories are very hard to find. Um, and so I've compiled a big, uh, you know, a, a bunch of different resources for that. Our second class is on preparations and dosages. So that is really, you know, just the basics of what form do the herbs come in? You know, how, a little bit about how you know which form to take your herb in. Um, and then we have a full, you know, we have two three hour classes during the course where we do uh, what's called herbal pharmacy. And that used to be one day where I brought pretty much my entire kitchen in uh, and we cooked things together. Now I, I do the best I can. Uh, you're not able to smell things, you're not able to taste things, but I will give you the visuals of, uh, of the whole process of how to make an extract, a tincture how to make uh, a strong medicinal infusion, how to make an herbal salve, um, and, and among other things. So then we begin, so the third class begins the main part of the course, which is the classes that have to do with the different body systems. Um, no body system works independently of the others. However, it, is the only way that I could find to really teach what we're looking to do in the, you know, with the herbs in the different um, uh, physiologies, the different uh, kinds of parts of the body. So we do the digestive system, the respiratory system, um, and all of this, we start with basic anatomy and basic healthy functioning, right? So for instance, in the, in the, um, uh, respiratory class. One thing that people don't realize is when you have a drippy nose, it doesn't always mean that you're sick. It could mean that the weather just changed, the air became drier, right? I'm just going to stop and read some. Uh, would it be able to attend Saturday classes live? Um, so if you if you work and you can't attend the class, you do have access to the recording. So if you can make you know, the majority of the classes live, that's great because you can ask your questions. Um, but I'm very flexible about if you, know, if you do the course by you know, watching the video and you come to class and you have a question about it, I'm happy, you know, I'm very flexible about making sure to answer your question. Um, uh, will you cover ethnobotany and decolonizing of herbal medicine? Um, so yes, I am very mindful of the need for decolonizing. Um, I don't, how can I say this? That's my perspective. My, my intention with the course is really just to help you to connect with the land in your area. I mean, it's one of the things that I, I have in the last few years, really encouraged students not to start herbal companies. There's so many herbal companies, find another way, be a teacher, you know, um, uh, garden, you know, um, but this is, an, a, you know, one of those, things in our, our very money-driven culture with all the inequities and all the, you know, the terrible things that happen in the name of capitalism. Um, I want to, you know, be 
instrumental in helping people to be able to take care of themselves without having to uh, live in that model. Um, that doesn't mean, I mean, you know, go off the grid or anything like that, but just, so I don't know if that was a very roundabout convoluted answer to your question. Um, with the certificate obtained, will I be able to start a business or practice? Uh, it's a good question. Four months of studying herbs, the answer would be no. Um, but green medicine is a very good foundational course. Uh, what I usually recommend if this is your first course and you're interested in becoming a practice, practitioner, um, really fashion for yourself three to four years of study. And that can be in any number of different ways. Um, and we do talk about this in some of the later classes. If you're interested in being a practitioner, um, the kinds of things you need to know. Um, you certainly can help your friends and family, right? You certainly, if you have a practice already, you certainly can, you know, use the herbs uh, in the practice, depending on the scope of practice of whatever it is that you do. Um, I know that, for instance, therapists can't really give substances to people, um, but there's ways of teaching about what you learn um, and making it available. Um, can you, yes, you can use my course towards AHG certification. I was a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild and myself chose not to continue um, for many reasons. The main reason being um, it's hierarchical and it didn't suit me. Uh, I like having my AHG, you know, certificate on the wall, but um, yeah. And would I recommend growing herbs indoors for those that live in a winter climate? Um, growing herbs indoors. Yes, there are many herbs that you can grow indoors. Um, and I would also encourage that if you live in an area where you cannot grow things outdoors, that you get to know the farmers at the farmer's market, that you get to know your um, community supported agriculture projects, because very often, I mean, I honestly, not to, you know, take credit, but I think that I was one of the more influential people to get the farmers at Union Square Farmers Market to sell things like nettles, chickweed, dandelion greens, et cetera, because there wasn't really a market for it. Um, but green medicine being in New York, you know, I would just tell my students, go to the farmers market and ask them. And they probably laughed their heads off because those were herbs that they had to work very hard to get out of their vegetable patches. And here they were getting paid an enormous amount of money to, to bring them to market. So, um, so, so the field guides, let me say a little bit about that because I do think everyone should have a, a, a field guide. I am partial to what are called Peterson field guides. Um, and those are the older ones that have drawings of the plants, uh, line drawings. It's much easier to identify a plant from line drawings than it is from photographs. Um, so just keep that in mind. And um, so, yeah, so just get, do, and all the different regions in the uh, country have different, so you have Western uh, plant identification, central, uh, mountain, Eastern. Um, so you just get the one from your own region. So back to the course, we do respiratory, nervous system, endocrine system, circulatory system, which is blood and lymph, skin, women's reproductive system, men's reproductive system. Um, and then um, there's a class called seasonal healing, how to work with the different seasons of the year. You know, 
simply put, you, you know, you're going to use different things in different seasons. You're going to focus on different um, functions of the body. Um, we have two guest teachers, David Winston and Drew uh, DiVittorio. Drew also teaches at the Open Center. He is um, an acupuncturist and Chinese medicine doctor, um, incredibly uh, thorough teacher. And he does one class on Chinese diagnostic techniques. And I, you know, I, I continue to have him come and do that because it just helps to sort of broaden the scope, right? A little bit to, you, you're not gonna really learn in depth how to read a tongue or take a pulse, but you'll get a real lay of the land. And if it's something that interests you, you can pursue it. Um, David Winston, uh, I like to call him the herbal, the walking herbal encyclopedia. He is probably one of the most knowledgeable herbalists on the planet, and he knows pretty much everything. And he's really um, also a very generous, thorough teacher. Um, and, um, and so he'll be, he'll be teaching uh, his class in two segments. It's changed, and I can't remember. I think one is on adaptogens. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but it should be on the website. And, um, and then we do uh, one class on Materia Medica, basically talking about what you might want to have on hand in your home um, at, for your herbal medicine chest, for lack of a better word. And then in the end, we have two uh, classes on case taking. So this would be helpful if you want to work with other people professionally, but also really, even if you're helping a friend, you want to know what, what do you need to know in order to be able to help them with, uh, with the herbs. Would the information in this course be applicable to a Pacific Island environment? The, the, the region is different, but I do think that um, the basic principles in the course should apply, right? You would just need to learn the Materia Medica of your region. Um, and if you can find a local teacher, that's always better. So um, um, you do receive a certificate at the end of this course. Uh, most other herbalists who run courses uh, or who accredit anybody know about this course uh, and it's, it's considered to be a very thorough foundational course. Um, so if you're just starting out, good place to start. I've had people take the course and that was enough and they just had a footing and they didn't want more information or more learning. I've had other students who just, you know, once they once they sort of entered into this way of thinking and understanding the herbs, just kept studying, studying, studying. And that's really the majority of people, right? Um, and it's not just the studying, sort of the book learning studying, but it's actually being outdoors, being with the plants. Um, being with other herbalists, um, networking, right? Getting to know your region. Um, we're, you know, we're in a very, very difficult time right now. Uh, and we have to you know, turn to the earth. There's, you know, that is really, I think our biggest call is to reconnect with the land in, in real ways. Um, this is why I really promote, you know, getting to know your local farmers and getting your food from your farmers, if you can, or community gardens. Um, there are many, many more options than there used to be. And uh, let me just see what we have here. Well, thank you, Amy. Okay. Um, oh, thank you, Yuko. Do you need to know any chemistry for the anatomy? No, this is very, so when I say anatomy, I'm really gonna show you a picture of that organ system and I'm going to uh, 
talk about what the different parts of it do, um, just so that you have like basics. Um, and I don't spend a whole lot of time on that because we have to cover all the, uh, so the, what the layout is we talk about the anatomy, the normal physiology, and we talk about all the common complaints that could arise. So we don't go deep into chronic, the treatment of chronic illness. Drew on one of his days does talk about chronic illness, um, but there's just not enough time in four months. Um, so, and I feel more confident, you know, with the training focusing on acute problems because you're not gonna get into any difficulty that way. Um, and, you, and you will have so many resources to help yourself, your family, your friends, and your community. Excuse me. So I think, do we learn preventive strategies? Yes, yes, yes. That's a big, uh, that's a big piece of, uh, you know, my philosophy is, you know, really to be, to learn how to really take care of, of ourselves. Um, it's not, it's not really encouraged. We're more encouraged to go get checked to make sure that nothing is wrong than we are to be given any tools of understanding of how, how to promote our health other than go buy a product, right? Which I, it, 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 it's painful to me, right? To see how many people spend so much money in the health food store buying supplements that somebody told them uh, was going to help them with their chronic condition. And some things do help, but really the herbs, think about the herbs this way. If you've ever known, uh, or if you've ever had a baby, or if you've ever known anybody who had a baby who was able to breastfeed the baby, breast milk for a baby is a perfect food. Right? It's not just like you take it to the laboratory and you measure all the things that are in it. it doesn't have a lot of iron. The protein level is kind of low, right? If you were really looking to think, you know, uh, chem chemically, what does this baby need? You probably think they need more of some of these things. But no, they need that much. But 100% of what's in the breast milk is absorbed. So. We have to think about the herbs that way. Uh, herbs are perfect in the sense that they match us. They've not been hybridized. The majority, I don't know of any herb that has actually been hybridized, a medicinal herb that's been hybridized. Dandelion leaves, but that's for their culinary, uh, you know, that's for the eating. They make them a little less bitter and a little longer, so you have more to work with. Um, but they are they are really, um, they're perfect for us. And the other thing I would say is that um, be careful about getting too enthusiastic and going out and gathering a lot of stuff. Um, there's just too many of us people on this planet and you want to be discerning, right? Not to just go out and gather everything you see, but to take some time and really learn, learn about the area that you've found that plant watch it for a couple of years, right? Um, there's this there's this tension right now. We have this, you know, urgency, right? It's what Martin Luther King called the urgency of now. We have this urgency, but we also have to take our time so that we start to move more slowly, right? The pandemic did some of that, but I don't know, everybody's itching to get back to normal. Um, and we, we need to really just stay mindful about uh, the normal is not going to be the old normal. Uh, is Brooklyn a good place for your teachings? Um, do you mean that would I come to Brooklyn? Or do you mean are there herbs in Brooklyn? in terms of finding herbs. Well, certainly, you know, Prospect Park is, has still some very, um, uh, is, so Prospect Park is a place to really identify some plants. 
Um, again, I wouldn't encourage you to go and uh, gather them because if even just a small number of New Yorkers went gathering in the parks, the plants would be decimated. So, you know, think about it first. Um, bulk herb stores, there's flower power. And then I don't know if this one in Brooklyn uh, is still around. I'm assuming it is because herbs have been very popular during the pandemic. Um, I think it's called the Herb Shop and I think it's on Atlantic Avenue. I've not been there, but I've heard about it. Um, okay, so Mountain Rose Herbs. Well, again, Mountain Rose Herbs is wonderful, but it's also in California or Oregon right? It's far away. So that would mean that whatever herbs you were getting would have to be shipped to you. So you want to be thinking about that, right? So it doesn't mean don't order. They're wonderful. They have great quality products. Um, but look for more, see if you can find something more local. Um, huh. Yeah, Valerian. Um, yeah. So valerian is very calming and very and very helpful with sleep. Yes, um, the root it's it's much it's very specifically a sedative. So some herbs will have different you know qualities to them, but valerian is very specifically a sedative. Um, and to be careful if you suffer with anxiety because sometimes the calming of the valerian can have a rebound effect of more anxiety the next day. Um, any other questions? Any questions about the course? The one thing that I so regret is that we don't have our field trip. We used to always have a field trip at the end of the course and can't do that right now. Um, I do wanna say if, if you want to be on my personal mailing list, not, not only the open centers, email me and just let me know and I'll put you on my mailing list. I don't send very many things out, but I do make announcements for things that I'm gonna be doing upcoming. Uh, are there textbooks? There are, yes, there will be a uh, reading list and I, I suggest that you read six books on during the course of the four months. If you're not big on reading, you can certainly get by without reading them, right? Um, but there's six books that's, you know, that's on a, a required, in quotes, reading list. And then I am a very uh, keen book lover. So I, you know, and I have a huge library. I'm always willing to make recommendations if you're interested in, in reading about something. Uh, my email address, yes, sorry. PikaTrenkel at gmail.com. Who is the founder of herbology? There is no founder. The founder would be God, right? Um, this is not, this is a, a good question in the sense that, um, yeah, this is like trying to own the ocean or own the sky. Like people do it, you buy air rights, you know, you own real estate under the water, but really, no. Um, and so this is really given to us. And this is one of the things about being, you know, environmentally conscious, um, ecologically minded, so that you're thinking about what your actions contribute either to the betterment of things or, or not. Um, and uh, will this certificate allow me to comfortably, that could be beneficial in aftercare? Yes, I do. Yes. If you already have a practice, um, it's, I think that yes, this course would allow you to be able to recommend herbs to your clients, as I said earlier, within the scope of the practice that you're in. I mean, I've been for 40 years in a non-medical, uh, non, 
well, a non-medical practice, meaning I don't have a license in anything. I'm very well educated in herbs. I'm very well trained in homeopathy. Neither of those fields offer licensing and I don't think that they ought to um, because I feel very strongly that once things become licensed, there get to be you know, big, you know, stronger and stronger parameters around what can happen um, and what the freedom that people have, right? Uh, so, but you know, we'll talk more about that uh, during the course. Um, so we're just about at an hour. And are we at, are we at time, Amy? Um, we are coming up on time, but if there's you know any questions and um, you have anything left to say, we can we can address them. Anybody? Um, is there a deadline to register? So you should be able to register via the link I put in the chat um, up until the beginning of the course. And you can always reach out to registration as well. Um, the classes will be recorded and you will receive them after each class. And if you have any further questions regarding uh, the class registration is very helpful and we'll be able to address them. And the link in um, the chat should be able to provide you with additional detail that you can read on. Wonderful. Well, I thank you all for showing up in this Zoom space. I love to teach and I'm always so grateful when people come to listen. So I look forward to seeing some of you on, uh, we start April 5th uh, and yeah, I mean, if you, if you have further questions, you can email me um, and all the best and stay well. And that's, that's it for tonight. On behalf of the Open Center, uh, we want to thank you, Pika, and thank you all for joining. We hope to see you again soon.